Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Better Divorce Podcast. As you know, I am Paulette Rico, your host, and today I'm going to tackle a topic that most of you are curious about, because what do you do after you divorce? Well, you can either uh, stay in your living room, watch a lot of Netflix, and pretend that you're not going to have these conversations about dating, or maybe you are going to want to think about dating. So today we are going to tackle the topic about dating. And I have a special guest for you by the name of Evan Mark Katz. He's the world's first dating coach since 2003, specializing in helping smart, successful women, listening up ladies, creating lasting love. He also has a platform called Love You, and we're going to dig into just what that is and how you can use his skills to help you. Welcome to the show, Evan. Thank you for having me, Paulette. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, let's jump right in. What makes you a divorce or a dating coach after divorce? Um, I don't know how it works in everybody else's business, but in my business, my clientele chose me. Mm. Um, I was a screenwriter in Hollywood, uh, couldn't make a living in my 20s. Uh, in my 30s, I got a job answering phones at an online dating company. Uh, and while I was there, uh, I wrote a book about online dating because it was such a fascinating and at the time new-ish topic. And unlike my Hollywood career, the book did well. And so I dropped out of film school. I became the dating guy and I was 31 years old. Now I'm 51. And so at the time, no one was doing this. There were no dating coaches. There was Online dating was under the radar. Now it is u- ubiquitous. So by having boots on the ground and using these services, being able to see people through this process, it gave me sort of a unique perspective as a guy who went out with 300 people over 10 years in online dating and has now been married for 15 years. So I come by my experience, honestly, there's no school to become a dating coach. Um, It's just a job that I made up and I've embraced and uh, I take great pride in. I love how you took something that wasn't working and turned it into something that was working because a lot of people don't do that. You know, they say stuck in what's not working. And I think that has a lot to do with the success of relationships too. Like when a career, you know, you, you, you shifted your career focus, right? From something. I I was given very little choice. And I, I I don't say that with any arrogance is, you know, plan A didn't pan out. So I had to come up with a plan B. What I didn't know is that plan B would be much better than plan A. Uh, And I think there is actually a good life lesson in that, especially when it comes to dating. People get very fixated on the kind of person they think they should be with. And they spend their whole life chasing that person, not realizing that person isn't compatible with you. You might need to look for a different kind of person. Hmm, Wonderful. Well, as many people know or don't know, after divorce, uh, the conversation starts to come up about, are you dating yet? Or are you seeing anyone? Or, <clears throat> and as you mentioned, the online platform, <clears throat> excuse me, is becoming more common. The feeling of using an app or an online dating platform to be the solution. Yeah, I mean, for, 40% of all couples meet online now. And I, I didn't do a very good job of answering your first question, which was why, why divorce women? Um, as I said, I made up this job, but the first five years of this, I was just a dating coach. I kind of hung out a shingle. 80% of my clients were women. And I didn't solicit women. Men need help. They just don't ask for it. Mm -hmm. So at a certain point in time, I realized, oh, I was a coach for women. I hadn't labeled myself as such, but women were the ones who were investing in themselves. They're more curious. They're more self-aware. They take more responsibility when things go wrong a lot of times than men. And so I pivoted in 2010 to focus exclusively on women. And then I realized, oh, the kind of people who reach out to me are indeed, this is a luxury good. These are women who actually do have everything. They have the master's degree. They have the home. They make six figures. This is the one thing they can't solve. And so uh, I get a pocket of clients who are in their late 30s and want to have kids and are getting kind of nervous. And then everybody else I get on the other side of their divorce. Right. The people who married the wrong guy at 27, stuck around for the kids, and now their life is starting all over in their early 50s. Right. Or, you know, husband dies. She's 64. She hasn't dated in 40 years. I get a lot of people on the other side. So 
Um, my job is just kind of meet them where they're at and hold their hand through what is often a scary and confusing process. And do you find that's still true, that women tend to invest more or research more about wanting to find a partner versus men? As you mentioned, men are not willing, are not as willing to reach out for help? Sadly, I think that's true. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think any of us could change the way things are globally. You could sort of just observe how things are. If it's a stereotype, the stereotype didn't come from nowhere that men refuse to ask for directions or that the self-help section of the bookstore is 90% books by women for women or that women go to therapy more and, and are more likely to turn to antidepressants and anti-anxiety anti me medicines. This is a thing that's actually happening. And so would it be a better world if men were more in touch, if men were more curious about what they can do better to be better partners and choose more compatible partners? Yes. But in the absence of that, I could help women make better dating and relationship choices instead of just lamenting the sad state of dating in men. Mm. It's a more empowering way to tackle life, I think. I agree. So why is dating more complicated now um, than ever before, particularly with the online platforms? It's a, it's a, a big question. Uh, that, that question itself could take up a good hour conversation between uh, you and I. Um, but... I think there's there's two things, and we, we gently touched on both of them. Um, one of them is sort of post second wave feminism, right? And we've eliminated the economic need for women to have to be married, right? If women now have one third more college educations, graduate law school and med school at a higher rate than men, have largely eradicated the the pay gap in most major cities. Now we have a situation where women have the option of choosing men rather than feeling forced to, like my mom went from her dad's house to her husband's house at age 21. That's not so much on the table anymore. So women don't have to be in relationships so they could afford to be choosier than they've been before. And the advent of technology, um, where it's gone from dating sites, Match.com, OkCupid, where at least there was a written profile and emails back and forth to everything's on the phone, you're looking at photos, you're swiping, and now we have infinite choice. And if we all have infinite choice, it makes a lot harder to make any choice. And so everybody's always looking for the next best thing because people are disposable and then they're treated like they're disposable and then everybody feels really bad about being disposable. But it's the medium that is creating the monster. Mm. For someone that's not familiar with online dating platforms personally, but I, through clients who have had sure. a conversation about them, I do hear a little bit of that, the social media fix thing where, you know, they're always kind of, I think you touched on it. Um, maybe if I go on this platform and this platform and maybe a third or a fourth or dare I say more, they'll find somebody better, somebody better, somebody better. There's a, they're always on the hunt, on the search, finding something faster, sleeker, you know. Is that, is that, it's like an addiction almost. They get like an, um, you know, like a little dopamine hit. Yes, it's the gamification of dating. It's like a slot machine. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a couple problems there. Number one, it's a misdiagnosis of the problem. Uh, which site do I go to to meet the right person is a nonsense question, even though it's the most popular question I get as a dating coach. So it's again, no disrespect to anybody who's asking the question. So before this interview ends, which site should I go to? Doesn't matter. Which gym do you need to go to to lose the most weight? That's, that's the same question. They all work. They all have free weights. They all have treadmills. They all have yoga classes. Whatever gym you go to, if you work hard there, you will lose weight. I've had clients fall in love on every single platform and you don't need to go to three, four different platforms. If you are going to three or four different platforms, once again, you're looking for the place that's gonna solve your problem when it's actually, how do you use the platform? How do you use the gym that will determine your success? Not where, what's the best gym? Sure, I agree with you. As somebody who's taught ballet, uh, yoga, Pilates, bar, aerial, I could go on. Um, it isn't the modality, it's the effort that goes into it and the commitment, sure. 
But that's not what that's generally not, not what people want to hear. They think that there's one site where all the great people are hanging out that no one told you about. When in fact, everybody does exactly what you, that you do. You bounce around from site to site to site thinking some site's going to solve all the problems. And what do you then see? Everybody's on every site. Mm. And is that common for people to go on more than one site? Sure. It's just not necessary. Got it. it it's just, it's what people do thinking the site's going to solve the problem. The question is, how how is your written profile? How are your photos? How are you appearing to the opposite sex? How much time do you put in? How many people do you talk to? What kind of conversations do you get into? Are you curious? Do you extend the conversation so it goes a little bit deeper? Do you screen people by by phone prior to going on a date? Do you insist on going on good first dates instead of quickie uh, coffee dates? How many people are you dating at the time at the same time? Are you sleeping with them prior to there's a million variations on where people take different paths. And I think like everything, probably dance, I don't know anything about dance. There's probably best practices. And that's all I've tried to do is try to lay out best practices so that all of these variables don't have to be so confusing. Mm. And I could see where it is confusing too. Sure. Now with a lot of clients, they tend to be, I'm going to use the word traumatized, affected by the conflict in their marriage and whether they're willing to own the part that they play in the demise of the relationship or not. Sometimes there's a lot of finger pointing and blaming of, well, she did this and she did that, or he did this and he did that. And I see that they carry that with them into the propensity of finding um, potentially a new partner or even a dating partner, not mm -hmm. even something long-term and romantic, but dinner type of thing. Um, and there's a lot of fear and anxiety about getting into ooh, another relationship. And particularly with divorcing clients, I see that they are always, uh, they, they're getting into the um, mindset that they had to fix the person that they were married to, that there was something wrong with them, that they tried to change them or I mean, that didn't work out too well. And they go into this um, overwhelmed and scared and anxious about, oh no, I don't need another problem to fix or another mm, puzzle. <laughs> uh, so with your expertise, you know, start at the beginning with somebody that's coming out of a negative or a bad experience or I uh, hate to use the word negative, but maybe not an optimal experience with the relationship. How do you get them to shift their thinking into getting a clean slate, starting over into a new mindset of that was the past, let's move forward and not take those mistakes with you? Sure. Um, you're familiar with the term limiting beliefs? I am. Right. So it, it, in my, my personal definition, a limiting belief is something that's partially true, but not totally true. Um, but we treat it like it's totally true. And humans are limited in our capacity. It takes great power to sort of step outside of your own paradigm and look at it objectively. So if hypothetically you come from a uh, family where mom and dad fought all the time, there was no healthy relationship, no affection, lots of tension. He ups and leaves and they get divorced when you're 12 years old, right? And he was a domineering father and you never really got a proper love and approval from him. And you're drawn to people like that and relationship dynamics like that because that is what, what's familiar. You unintentionally recreate that. And if you married someone, right, and some aspect of that dynamic is similar to the dynamic that you had as a kid. And you don't have to be a psychologist to do this. I'm not a psychologist. If something is familiar, we go and repeat it. And then we can become convinced that that's the way relationships are. And what's your sample size? Two. Your parents' relationship and your messed up marriage. And you're, you treat that, that's, that's the way love is. Doesn't, doesn't everybody have to censor themselves? Doesn't everybody have to walk on eggshells? Doesn't everybody have to fight 50% of the time and right, be gaslit? No, that, that's, that is your very, very narrow slice of life. And one of the better things about being an old dating coach is I've really gotten a chance to see lots of people's dating and relationship dynamics. 
And once you can get people to look outside of their paradigm and you show them, no, there are happy marriages. There are functional marriages. We need to describe what that looks and feels like because it might be explaining to a blind person what the color blue looks like. That's really challenging. So we don't send people in my Love You program, we don't tell people to start dating right after their divorce. People come to us when they're ready and then they have an anxiety and they have very valid anxieties. They're anxious about online dating, which is scary. They're anxious about rejection, which is scary. Sex with someone new could be scary, right? Dating multiple people could be scary. Um, finding yourself in another relationship where you feel neglected or or the person's emotionally unavailable is scary. Giving all your love to someone who might abandon you is scary. Getting stuck in a dead end marriage where, you're, where you don't wanna get divorced again is scary. So all of those fears paralyze everybody and then what do they do? Nothing. The easiest thing to do is nothing. And I don't, again, I don't wanna to touch your statistics. I have slightly different statistics. One statistic that I throw around is that post-divorce men, I've read, 65% of men are looking to get remarried again. But because women initiate two thirds of divorces, because men are not always great communicators, so women initiate more divorces. And because they associate marriage with unhappiness, less than 50% of them want to be remarried. They're done with marriage, right? And I see a lot of that. They come to me because they're bone lonely. I'd love to fall in love again, but I don't want to be married. Right? And that's the story that they tell because they associate marriage with fighting, unhappiness, being trapped. Right? I want something that looks just like marriage, but not marriage. <laughs> so there's so many fears that we need to eradicate before we can really get people into healthy dating patterns. And thank you for letting me talk uninterrupted. That's, that's really challenging hosting. So well done. Anytime. Now, I really made a great segue. I want to talk about Love You. I think it's fascinating that you have a system, a methodology, a platform that helps because I do believe that's what people need. Tell us about Love You. What is it? Um, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, I was a coach for 10 years or so when I decided to put this together, together and it took me about two years to do it. Real, realized I was having the same conversation with everybody. Mm. Right? There's certainly, you know, uh, similar things that come up, some of which we talked about just on today's conversation. So if you're having the same conversation with every single person in different forms, the best thing to do to reach more people is to film it. So I rented out office space. I got a Hollywood camera crew, two cameras set up, and it's this super pro massive online course. There's 280 videos in there. It's like a library, right? But it's designed to be curated so you're not drowning in stuff. It's basically a half hour of video a week, 10 three minute videos on a different dating and relationship topic for 26 weeks. And the first month is focused on confidence, which is what everybody's lacking, right? When they come to me, once we get your confidence back, we could talk about dating, very specifically meeting men, flirting, online dating, that portion of things, generating opportunity. The third month is on dating, which is between when you meet someone and whether you decide you're going to be a couple. Right? And then the second half of the course is all about relationships, understanding men, relationships, and commitment are the themes of those modules. Mm -hmm. So basically, we give you a, a lifetime access and education to all of the curriculum, audio, video, transcript, exercise. And then we have a private Facebook group and an online and a coaching community where we get on Zoom and we have everybody asking questions in a live Q&A for two hours every single week. So there's a lot of information, there's a lot of support, there's a lot of personal attention. And my job is to get people unstuck the same way if you're going to the gym, because you look in the mirror on New Year's Eve, and you're 25 pounds overweight, and you're not don't like how it feels. And you're like, this is the year when people are ready for change, they sign up for love you. And by the time they graduate, they're in a decidedly different place. Perfect. And I don't want to assume that the goal of love you is for everyone to get remarried or married. It, no, because our, our, our job is not to tell you what you want. Our job is to enable you to get what you want. For someone who, who hasn't, who's recently divorced and um, hasn't dated for 20 years and isn't even sure if she wants to get married, we'll use that as an as, as a example. 
it would be a mistake if she got married uh, on my watch in six months. She'd be moving way too fast. So maybe for her, just learning to put herself out there, market herself online, set up a dating practice where she goes out with one new guy a week and knows how to set healthy boundaries and learns to trust her judgment and have fun and love you. We tell women, you're the CEO of your love life and men are the interns applying for a job. <laughs> Imagine going out with that level of confidence that is a gift. I love it. Now, is there any particular age or demographics that this works for? Is it across the board successful for everybody? The, it's, a, it's a really good question. A lot of people think that you need to create something very specific. Oh, you need a completely different curriculum for people who are in their 30s and people in their 70s because people in their 30s are dealing with childbearing and people in their 70s are erectile dysfunction and you don't need a whole, those are just different questions to ask on coaching calls. Most of these questions are about confidence and relationship dynamics and communication and knowing what's healthy and what's unhealthy and what you should step away for. Like it, it's, it's most of it is like, you know, 95% is universal. And then as individuals have individual experiences, we could address those indiv individual experiences, but short of everybody who's listening, joining love you, I would just tell you this. If you want to know what to do in a dating relationship situation, ask yourself, what would a confident person do? You know, like we got our little, what would Jesus do bracelets? What would a confident woman do in this situation? That's usually going to tell you the answer that I would tell you. Mm -hmm. Most people, because of their life experience, are so hurt, so bitter, so jaded, mm -hmm. so scared, right? And fear is not your friend when it comes to dating. It, it, it has negative effects on your choices. So we have to kind of rewire that and get you to a place where you're coming from a place of confidence and abundance and trust and things that you don't associate with all the emotions you have in your marriage. Mm. Love it. So in my world, is the bumper sticker that you mentioned, what would Jesus do is what would the judge say? I always think mm. it that way. You know, so, you know, everything you say and do is all, always going to come back to that. What would the judge say? Right. Beautiful analogy. Um, so one more question here before we kind of segue. Uh, if you're meeting someone um, and you're having a conversation with someone, you in particular, not me, this isn't my world. I would say, you know what? I'm an expert in a lot, of, in a lot of things, but this is not my expertise. Sure. When somebody comes to you and they're afraid to jump back into the dating world, how do you encourage them to go ahead and take the leap if they really want to? If, if someone wants to take the leap, yeah, they just need to know that they're not going to fall. That's, that's the thing, right? It's just, you know, action is just putting one foot right in front of the other. That's why I use the, uh, the gym metaphor is most people struggle in some way with their, their weight or their health or their body type. And we go through cycles when it's important to us, when it's not important to us. I can't light a fire under anybody. What I ask people to pay attention to is really their own feelings, which they tend to compartmentalize. And I, again, I'll say this really gently because it sounds like an attack and it's definitely not meant to be an attack. All my clients are single women. But what I see a lot is when someone has been burned by love, they keep themselves really, really busy, mm. really busy. They just overschedule. They'll work more. They'll travel more. They'll take on more hobbies and salsa events and yoga retreats and a second language and go to the dog park and have tea parties for their dogs. I mean, anything to avoid feeling alone, right? And, and, and I ask people to allow themselves to feel, are you just a hamster on a treadmill to ignore the fact that you would like to have someone who loves you unconditionally? If so, you need to create time for love. So when people can start to actually feel, whew, my life is just like a hamster on a wheel rat race designed to anesthetize me from feeling my feelings, but boy, I would just like some man to make me coffee on Sunday morning or listen to me after a hard day or make love or plan dinner for me so I don't have to think of everything myself. To be taken care of, a lot of people turn off that thing because smart, strong, successful women don't need anybody to take care of them. And we all need someone to take care of us. Mm -hmm. So 
it's an emotional thing that I can't make someone feel, but when they feel it, they need to know that there's a resource. I, I'm glad to be that resource for people who are trying to get back out there the way a personal trainer is a resource for someone who's really determined to get into shape. So there isn't any particular period of time. Like it's a safe bet if you've been divorced or out of your own story six months or a year. I, I don't like to put arbitrary things on that because, you know, probably better than I do. There's people who were in dead end marriages for a decade. They were functionally divorced, mm -hmm. right? And the paperwork just made it official. So it's when you feel a lack, right? The definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. When you pay attention to the idea and listen to the little voice in your head that says, this was fine for now. Right? Okay, maybe I needed to play after my divorce. That's fine. Right? I need to be free. I need to find myself. Fine. No one is telling you what you need to do. When you decide, oh, this was good. This is what I needed to do. Now I want to start building something again. I don't want to be the 60-year-old woman who is single. It was fine when I was 53, but now the kids are out of the house. I got more time. I want something. I want someone to travel with. I want someone to wake up next to. I want to experience unconditional love in a way that no one can, has given to me in my entire life. I think we just underestimate how important unconditional love is. And my clients tend to take care of other people. They care. They cared for their shitty husbands and they cared for their kids and they care for their clients and they care for their ailing parents. And they've lost sight of the fact that no one's actually caring for them. And so to me, that's priceless. And that's why I have a, have a job after 20 years is because the people who, who identify that on their own are great, highly motivated clients who are easy to help. And when you can, when you find that it's, it's beautiful. So I, I as, that. as someone you, you said, you have that, I'm glad that I have that. And it's not being smug to say, yeah. why wouldn't someone want someone to love them unconditionally and take care of them and wake up every morning thinking how they can make your day better. So you bring up a beautiful point. So what actually is the difference between the common thought of settling or compromising, you know, like what actually is the difference? Like, you know, you always get what you settle for just to get into a new relationship. Sure. Um, I, I wrote something down when you were speaking earlier, I keep all my notes okay. and little post-its and since this is a divorce podcast, I wanted to just bring up one thing before I answered your answer your question about settling versus compromising. Please do. Um, I call it the overcorrection. This wasn't in the notes, right? The overcorrection is when you were lacking something in your marriage and you know you need to have it, but you go too far in the other direction. Mm. So you dated a guy and he was a slacker and you were the mother and the father and the breadwinner. And you're like, oh my God, I need a guy with money. And then you go out into the world and you find a guy with money and boy, he's loaded, but he works 60 hours a week. He travels 15 weeks a year. He doesn't have time for you. You're not a priority, but at least he's got money. Or you had a passionless marriage. You didn't have sex for the last five years. You go out and chase chemistry and then you can find a guy with this amazing chemistry, but he's an emotional basket case, but at least the chemistry is strong. And this is what happens. We go too far in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And my belief in real life tends to show everything in moderation works a lot better. And we're, you're allowed to do whatever you want post-divorce. You can overcorrect and make those mistakes, but be very clear, going too far in any extreme direction is going to bite you. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to say that because it's, I don't think it's something that's said often enough to divorce people. Um, I think they're basically encouraged, just go, be free, do whatever the hell you want. And I do think we need some boundaries. I do think we need some guidelines. Otherwise, you're going to get hurt. You're going to waste some. You're going to waste some time. You might hurt someone else unintentionally. Mm. Um, so it's not that you have to go immediately back into relationship zone. Just be really conscious of what you're doing when you're doing it, and don't blind yourself that just because a guy has money that he's a good person, or because you have great sex that you guys are compatible. It just means he has money and it's great sex. It has nothing to do with whether he's a good partner or not. Overcorrect. That's the word of the day. Nice job. And so your your question, which I, I didn't do a good job of answering, please bring me back to it. The compromising and the settling. Uh, well, this was, I was a, an unintentionally a good segue. 
Uh, you compromise your way into happiness. You settle your way into misery. The difference is how you feel about it afterwards, which is to say they both involve trade-offs, mm -hmm. right? Everybody makes compromises and trade-offs. Your job is a compromise and a trade-off. Your friends and family are a compromise and a trade-off. Your home, the city in which you live, is a compromise and a trade-off, right? You get something, you give something else up, and you make peace with it. I live in Los Angeles. It's beautiful weather. There's really great culture. There's a lot of traffic, right? We could question the taxes and we could question some of the people, LA with its dreamers and homeless people. And we could get into it, but all in all, I like living in LA. It's where I've chosen to build a life. I understand the compromises and trade-offs and I make peace with it. I don't wake up every morning shaking my fist at this guy that I should be in Boston because mm -hmm. that would be a ticket to misery. Mm -hmm. And so when we consider we make trade-offs everywhere, and we could do this with your job easily, right? I work too hard. I'm underpaid. I get paid a lot, but there's a lot of pressure. I got this boss I don't like working with. There's this commute. There's, I'm not creative, but there's the golden handcuffs. There's a million versions of these trade-offs. The only place we, we think we shouldn't trade off, Paulette, love. Mm -hmm. We think we should get a partner with only good qualities and no bad qualities, which is nonsense. A little unrealistic. Right. And we also lose sight of the fact that if we have good qualities, on the flip side of those qualities are bad qualities too, Sure. right? And the people who are the savviest when it comes to dating make smart trade-offs and they compromise on the right things. But most people don't. Most people compromise on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. We won't compromise on height and weight and age and education and income and religion and politics. We won't compromise on those, right? We need to date someone who's just like us, but better. But we will compromise on kindness and character, consistency, communication, commitment, connection. Any couple that's ever been divorced got divorced because of one of those things, not because he was 5'8", or she made 125,000 and he made $85,000. That is not the reason they got divorced. Mm -hmm. Character, kindness, consistency, communication, commitment, character. And so do we look for that when we're dating? Nope. We go on Bumble and we swipe through faces and we see who we think is cute and tall and rich. And we keep our fingers crossed that he's nice too. It's always an added bonus, right? And so now we can see the difference between settling and compromising. Mm -hmm. Right. You're not settling if you're with a guy who's five foot seven. You're settling if you're in a relationship with a guy who makes you feel small. Yeah. Many people, when they learned that I lived in Belize for three years, could not believe, oh, you know, it sounds like paradise. Well, there's a big trade off to living in the middle of the Caribbean on an island in the middle of nowhere. It sounds sexy and glamorous and beautiful and the weather's fabulous and, you know, fresh seafood all you want. And, oh, you know, you're always running around in a bikini, hanging upside down from a piece of fabric, teaching aerial yoga. <coughs> you know, it just sounds so like, you know. It, no, it's really, it's, it's so funny you should mention this. Last night I was out with a friend of mine who lives in my area. We do bar trivia together. And he was telling me he was thinking of buying uh, lakefront property in Guatemala. And he was showing me pictures and he's, he's so excited. And I was thinking, are you sure about that? You want to build a house, right? Like this is land by a lake. There's no electricity. There's no plumbing. He's like, but there's avocado and mango trees. And I was like, <laughs> you sure? He goes, you yeah, know, th there's enough property. I could build two houses, one for a, 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 an Airbnb and one for my vacation house. So I was like, that sounds like it's going to be a lot of trouble to, from scratch, build a, two houses in Guatemala with local contractors when you don't speak Spanish. Like, but all he sees is the dream. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, again, I was like, I, I, didn't, I didn't rain on his parade. I was just thinking, well, it's not really my dream. I, I might dream of visiting you there, but I, I don't dream of owning it. <laughs> Well, thank goodness we do have somebody that manages the property, but a friend of mine who's staying there, she sent me an email and she said, I can't get the washer to work. Well, if the generator isn't full up, then the washer and the dryer are not going to work because 
Anyway, we could have a four hour conversation about living. I, I already used up what I know about that part of the world. So, um, but, but yes, I, I, I think understanding just the, the concept of trade offs and in love, we really think we should marry someone who is all of the things. Yeah. And we don't calculate which of the things is the most important, not for today, but for the next 20, 30, 40 years, right? Like we, we just we just overestimate the value of certain characteristics and underestimate the value of other characteristics. So I try to just help people dial in that you could date a top chef, supermodel, Rhodes Scholar, but if every time you wanna have a serious discussion, he yells at you, or pulls away, or breaks up with you. Who cares if he's a top chef, supermodel, road scholar? And never forget that getting remarried is a legal binding contract. And if you're not down with that, and you're not willing to share all of you, then you may want more than just dating advice. So. Sure, sure, and I, yeah, and that's. That goes back to your area of expertise. It's a valid uh, marriage, pardon the pun, right? To really understand the psychological, mental, emotional part of it, as well as the spiritual, physical, sexual part, but yet the judicial, legal, financial too. It's it's a very you know nuanced world out there getting into a new relationship and feeling whole with it and not... Uh, well, I think, and that's why I think it's one step at a time. Uh, a lot of people after divorce are reinventing their life in a way they didn't anticipate that they would be reinventing their life. And it's a blank canvas, it's like graduating college. What am I going to do now? It's, it, it's infinite opportunity, but that's also kind of anxiety producing in its own right. And so pe people don't know exactly what they're looking for. And then they meet other people in the dating market who are also confused and ambivalent where you have a lot of people sort of circling each other and they want to find love, but they sure don't want to get married. They sure don't want to have to get lawyers involved and property. And so it's just everybody's sort of feeling each other out and they're all burned by, they all had this one massive negative experience, which cost them so very much time, energy, emotion, money. And so the thought is why would I ever want to put myself through that again? And the answer, of course, is you won't put yourself through that again if you choose wisely. Um, but most people don't trust their judgment to choose wisely. And that, again, is where someone like me would come in and you would come in on the other end of that uh, is once they've made a good choice. Well, what does this mean as adults with money and property and life experience and ch kids and all that. Yeah, it's more and more common that I'm writing prenups and postnups as well as alternative dispute resolution and mediation. Divorce coaching is something I do as a result of that. So sure. uh, thank you for this very enlightening conversation. I, I appreciate your edu your your insight and on your perspective. You've obviously done your homework. So what is the best way for people to work with you, follow you, and learn more about the work that you do. Uh, thank you, Paulette. It's really kind of you. Uh, my name is Evan Mark Katz. Uh, I'm very Googleable. Uh, you could find me pretty much everywhere. I have a, my own podcast. It's called the Love You Podcast. Find me on Instagram, realevanmarkkatz.com. Um, and I made a gift for uh, your listeners today. So if you go to evanmarkkatz.com forward slash better divorce, um, I made a special 25 page report for people who are just starting to date called the seven massive mistakes you're making in dating. You probably don't even know that they're mistakes. That's why they're interesting. And uh, I'll send you free dating and relationship advice until you no longer need free dating and relationship advice. And if you are in that place emotionally where you want to build something real and you don't know how, you could always apply to love you, uh, evanmarkatz.com forward slash now. Uh, that's all the self-promotion I will do for today, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to, to connect with you. Uh, you're, you're doing good work out there, Paulette. Thank you. They all need you, Evan. There's life after divorce, everyone. It's very uh, important that you know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, even though I'm a divorce expert, I'm remarried and I believe in love. I believe in marriage. I believe in connection and having a, a relationship that's fulfilling and it means the world. So thank you. And everybody out there, it's all in the show notes. Take advantage of Evan's offer. Don't go it alone. 
gain the confidence and skills that you need to re-enter the dating world wisely. And until next time, make it better.